Chapter 6, Plague of Madness In a way, I got that moose. He visited me in my dreams. I was walking along the sandy shores of the Huron, the surface brown and healthy, and there on the other side, beside the weeping willow that dipped the tips of its branches into the water, stood the moose. He wasn't watching me, but he, I knew he knew I was there. Another time, I was walking through the bush, my right hand outstretched against the cool brick of the building, buried deep in the trees. I followed the wall straight for a mile until it turned the corner. I walked around the corner, and the way down this side, which seemed to go on for another mile, was the moose, blocking the path between the brick and the dense thicket of bush. I started walking towards him. I woke up before I reached him, fingers already anticipating the soft warmth of his flank. It was a calmer time for us. There hadn't been a recruiter sighting for weeks, and we settled into a more leisurely pace. We enjoyed this new cadence, taking time to help Chiboy gather sticks for arrows, playing in the clearing dotted with strangely robust flowers new to the territory. Only Wob seemed stressed. She rushed ahead when we took our time. She was the last to fall asleep, walking the perimeter of the camp and double-checking the wire alarms. She ate little and said even less. There was no real way to figure out what was wrong. Wob was prickly on the best of days. So we stopped asking her to join our games and stopped offering her the best cuts of meat. She wouldn't take them anyway. Her mood stayed the same for days until one night at the fire, after Minerva and the younger kids and the twins had wandered off to bed, she asked a question. Do you think circumstances make people turn bad? Or that people make circumstances bad to begin with? Meg exhaled a long plume of smoke. Well, it's not, that's not an easy question. Rose walked over from her tent, having grabbed a sweater and returned to the circle, sitting between me and Wob. Chiboy and I stared into the flames of dying fire, waiting for the old man to continue. I was surprised to hear her talk after such a long silence and wanted to engage, but if anyone could address her question, it would be him. I read this book once, written by this Algerian fellow. Camus was his name. He, ex he examined the heater on his smoke, packing it in and trimming the ashes by dragging it along the rock by his feet. Anyway, in this story was all these people trapped inside their own town because the, of the plague attacks them, and they are put into quarantine. I'd never heard this story before, but I knew what a plague was. That's what they were calling the dreamlessness when it started, a plague of madness. So these people, they start to change. Some of them, like the doctor, stay close to the same because he gives everything he's got, his time, his expertise, his clinic, to working for the people. But I guess that changes too, just closer to his real nature. So we change because of circumstances. But if you're a good person, you change in a good way. Wob sought to cut to the message right away. Well now, not necessarily. He stepped out the butt and popped the remainder of his pocket to roll into the next one. I think it's more like you do what you need to do in order to keep yourself intact. It's about motivation. Like how we're motivated to run because of the recruiters, Rose jumped in. And the recruiters are motivated to run after us because of the schools? Almost, he answered. We're actually both motivated by the same thing. Survival. But isn't it just us that's trying to survive? No one's trying to kill those jerk-offs. But nevertheless, they are dying, mostly killing themselves, mind you. And so they're motivated by the need to be able to survive. And they see that solution in us. Wob was on her knees now, listening so hard she was leaning towards each speaker. So we're the same? In a way. So then I'm right. If we're both motivated by the same thing, and they're the ones hurting people, then that's their nature. They're bad to begin with. Mig steepled his hands and paused before he asked, What would you do to save us? We looked at each other, faces bright with the singular light of the fire. We were family. We were all that we had. The rest was dark and unknown. It was Cheboy who answered, Anything. Wob spoke after him. Everything. Rose reached across the space and put her hand on mine. I grabbed it and laced our fingers together. Exactly. We all do what we can to survive. Right now, they can chase us, and us, we can run. It may not always be this way, and who is to say what we will be capable of? We were quiet for so long. Mig began to stand, pushing his hands on his thighs when Wob spoke again. I saw men in the woods. Mig sat back down. We waited. When we were on the hunt last week, two of them, she looked up at us, and I knew one of them. Chiboy slid closer to her. Who was it? She shook her hair. Someone who wasn't very honest. Someone from my old life. Chiboy got uncharacteristically gruff. 
the one who did this? There was anger in his voice, and he touched her chin where the scar ended. No. She pulled back and stood up. I didn't know him very well. He was with the other one. Indian? Mig asked. And she nodded, and Rose squeezed my hand a little. We were always excited at the possibility of more of us. Mig must have seen the look on our faces, the sudden excitement, because he said, Not every Indian is an Indian. We stayed there in silence until the fire died out, then made our way to our tents.